So when it started was um, BBC Worldwide. There's a team called the Digital Hub team. Um, if you imagine, um, has everyone heard of the BBC? BBC content? Ima have you heard of um, iTunes? Yep, so you can get some content on iTunes. So that's been digitized, okay? So it's taken some broadcast content and digitized it and put it through to iTunes. And you can imagine all the different plethora of outfit outlets that will take that digitized content. So this team was built, were building products that would enable that, that content to be digitized, okay? Um, so we're in Media Village in White City in West London. Um, it was quite a small team to start with. There was nine staff, so we had an analyst, an architect who coded. Um, quality assurance are testers and developers, okay? But also working with various different third parties who were off-site, so it's not your atypical agile co-located team. Um, the operating cost is 1.5 million pounds per annum, and the team were developing .NET applications using C Sharp and all those kind of good technologies like SQL Server. And as I mentioned before, they created new products, but they also maintained existing products. And uh, Peter came in for 12 months to look at how the team had progressed in terms of their maturity. They started off as a typical agile team, um, but they wanted to move on to something called Lean and Kanban, um, which is something that I introduced with the team, and you'll see the results as we go through of applying that within the agile teams. Um, they reported their progress to within a PRINCE2 framework, so business reports, project reports, red, amber, green reports, and that kind of stuff. Who here uses red, amber, green reports? Anybody? You heard of the RAG reports? So there's a guy called Rob Tomset has got a really good saying, red and the green reports are like watermelons. They're green on the outside, but red on the inside. And I think it's really good. So it goes red on the last day of the project. So we wanted to use something like Lean and Kanban to dis get dispense with that and have more visualization and more transparency about what things were working and what weren't. And the team themselves moved from a waterfall price approach, Prince 2 approach to Agile and then on to Lean. Great. Um. Okay, so the, en the engineering practices that um, were used within the team, so test-driven development, which Mary talked about before. So if you're writing some software, you write some, a test first, then you write the code to make that test pass, okay? And what that means is you'll have a whole series of scaffolding around your code, which if you ever get an error, that error will be picked up by that code, okay? By that scaffolding, so it gives you peace of mind and reduces risk. We had a fleet of automated tests. So if you imagine you have a product and it presses all the buttons and then you release a new version of the product, it automatically presses all those buttons again to make sure they still did the same functionality. So kind of automation. Uh, we had source control software. Mary talked about that earlier. Obviously bug tracking software. Um, and the product itself was a large legacy code base. You had to release everything at once or nothing at once. It was all or nothing. So massive batch sizes in terms of releasing or not. So any new development had to go all at the same time. Um, we'll talk about MMF's minimal market features later on. Um, the team were practicing Agile, so doing things like a daily stand-up. The team would get together for 15 minutes in the morning and talk about what they worked on yesterday, what they're planning to work on today, and what's blocking them, okay? And it was up to the project manager and the iteration manager to remove those blockers. Different to the normal project management method, which is this is what you're working on today, and why didn't you work on something that I asked you to do yesterday? Instead, the team, it's not a status report, the team is saying this is what I'm planning to work on, and that's that communication and collaboration for that 15 minutes. Great, so, so we're not s saying you know, with lean software, you still need good engineering practices, and you still need good tools and, and, and automation. Um, really, uh, the key insight here, well, one of the insights is we need to improve the, the legacy code. If you want rapid deployment, uh, there has to be investment of clean, cleaning up the code. So, um, you know, it's quite legitimate to ask your analysts and people to, to run some metrics to show the complexity of the code, where, where the changes have been made, to show you the architecture of it, you know, the structure of it. Um, you know, often they're, they're quite shy about that because it's usually a mess, uh, but that's worth, worthwhile. And what we wanted to do really is we wanted to use lean thinking to improve the process and things like XP, extreme programming, to improve the product. So coupling the two together. So on, on there it says about visual management. So this is the first thing you do when using Kanban in your office. Um, and I've seen this work with non-software teams is just make the workflow visible. And it's quite astounding. If you put every piece of work that your team is currently working on on a wall 
and you have your value stream and you can see where the pieces of work are. It's phenomenal how much work people are actually doing. So point one is to make that visible. It's, a, it's something there's a guy called Chris Argyris that talks about valid data and informed choice for human beings. So you're getting some valid data, you're seeing some information up on the wall and you're getting that learning there that these guys are working on way too much once. Often it's hidden in inboxes or spreadsheets or Gantt charts and people don't really know how much people are working on at one time or where the bottlenecks are and those kind of good things. So this was, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's a crude graphic, but I'm really fond of it. So uh, this is a lake, and it's the blue, it's the water, and then the, the brown things are the rocks, and they're the sources of, of errors. And at the moment, in, in the, I'd say the vast majority of software organizations, the blue is all the untested code and the requirements and the specs and all the rest, and it, and it hides really what's, what's, what's going on. So to reduce the work in progress, we, we talk about draining, draining the lake. And Toyota t talk about um, uh, an error is a gift. You know, if something goes wrong, it's, it, you know, it's, the, it's the process talking to you, the voice of the process, and it's a gift, and you really want to treasure it. And unfortunately, in our culture, we want to hide it if it goes, if it goes wrong. But by deliberately making the rocks stick up and hurt you, um, and, um, and so that's, yeah, that's the, 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 the metaphor that we, that we want. And I like this saying that no problem is a problem. So often problems are hidden and you don't want to expose any problems. Certainly in organizations that I've worked in, you have a risk management strategy, but people don't want to put the risks in that system because they'll be looked at to say, well, why is that a risk? Because it goes, um, gives that manager or manager's manager problems. Um, so we wanted to, again, make those kind of things visible. Um, as I mentioned before, the stuff that's normally hidden or it's in computer systems, make them visible for people to see. And when you do this, you, you get an amazing raft of problems. You find people who are in the wrong job, people who aren't properly trained, people who haven't got the, um, the seniority to go on training courses that they need to go on. You know, there's a whole massive range of problems will jump out. And, and then, then the really hard work begins because you then have to organize with budgetary control or with personnel or with maintenance to get the office layout changed or electricity supplies moved and things. So once you you know the problems, you then, it, it kicks up a whole lot of, of work. How long does it take for development just to do development? Okay, so it's completely within the team's control. And as you can see here, um, the time um, t fell from by 73%. And when we spoke to the developers, we said, well, this, this has got to be game, doesn't it? How could you possibly have such a reduction in the time it takes you to develop stuff? Are you just typing faster or something like that? And they said, well, the reason is we're only working on two things at once. So this is what I said before, we've got data to back up a limiting work in process, okay? Um, so this helps, so showing managers some evidence that this crazy stuff of limiting work in process actually works helps justify that to do that in more teams. So that just summarizes what we've already talked about in terms of the results that this team achieved. And um, well there's, there was, it wasn't just the one team. What we found is this became a virus, it's called the Kanban flu which is one team starts doing this, another team see the visual management and think, oh, I'll give that a try. And it's because it's a low barrier entry, you can start with what you're doing now. It just went everywhere and lots of development teams, so SAP teams were using, SAP teams were using this, people doing product development, people doing support, and they were all producing the same kind of results, you know, because they're limiting that work in process and having different kind of data-based conversations. But what was the value delivered? So it's all well and good um, delivering stuff faster, but are you just delivering the wrong thing faster? So what you can see here is that digital assets produced by, rose by hundreds of thousands of hours, and we had a 610% increase in valuable assets output by the team in that period. So that's pretty phenomenal. So it's not just about making something efficient, it's about that effectiveness that I mentioned before. So just to, to conclude, um we, we re really have no, no doubt that this lean approach, you know, the, you know, the, the concept of lean can, can apply within software and be, be very effective. We think it takes agile to the next level. It shows where to go with agile, uh, I, I believe. It's very low risk from a management point of view because it reduces both market risk and, and technical risk by, by small uh, deliverables. It also delivers value more quickly because we only put stuff in that's very high value to the to the customer. And that maturity, I think, is, is one of the key points. So David Anderson's got a few case studies where teams move from CMI level one to level three within a year. 
by applying this because you've got quantitative measures and you can d d demonstrate the, uh, the maturity that the team has and um, has improved upon. Yeah, so you get the holy grail really. You get a, great, a lot of discipline, but you get the agility that you can, you can respond to the market very, very quickly. Uh, if you want more uh, data on it, the, the paper here is, is up on the, on the website as the uh, IEEE transactions paper. And uh, yeah, that does give qu quite a lot of detail. And if you want to email us or anything, you're, you're more than welcome. Yeah, so there's a link there where you can download the paper. And uh, what I tend to do is send that round to people in new organizations that I work in because they say, well, this stuff, will it work? And it's good to have a case study. But what we don't want to promote is copying. We don't say, we'll do exactly what happens in that case study and it'll work here because their value stream, their customers and values going to be different. But it gives them an indication of what's possible. And then you can start saying, well, let's just visualize your work stuff, workflow and then move from there, which is what we advise that you can start on Monday. All right, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.